All right, let me wake somebody up. <laughs> so I hope you, everyone's having a good morning so far and presenting LLVM Linux, the Linux kernel with Dragon Wings. I present Bian Webster from Converse Inco Incorporated. Please welcome Bian. Thank you very much. Yeah, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, essentially compi compiling a Linux kernel with Clang, uh, an alternate com uh, compiler to what is more traditionally used in the Linux community, which is, of course, GCC. So the first thing I tend to get asked a lot, and uh, so I'm going to go over it again, even though I know some of you already know the answer, is what is Clang and or LLVM? And that's the first thing people get confused about is, is uh, essentially what is, it, what is it all about. And it's really two things. The first thing is it's actually a toolkit. It's a, it's a uh, set of libraries, a set of pieces of code that can be used for building different things. One of them happens to be a compiler. Uh, you can build linkers, uh, there are source code analysis tools, uh, there are tools for extracting metadata for things like documentation or what have you. It doesn't really matter how you, you slice it. Ultimately, you can use the same code that's used for the compiler to parse and then the same grammar in order to pull out information from the, uh, the parse tree that comes out of that. So things like code refactoring tools, you can build them into IDEs, a lot of the stuff where we tend to have to re-implement the parser and the grammar in order to get that same goodness in other tools, uh, in more traditional tools. With Clang and LLVM, you can actually use the same code uh, in, your, in your other tools that you want to build. It's also a tool chain. So in fact, there is a compiler. The one we use is, is Clang. It's a C, C++, Objective-C compiler. Uh, there's uh, the equivalent of libgcc called CompilerRT. Again, it's a series of highly optimized uh, routines that are used at a low level. Well, that's primarily used in user space, not so much in uh, kernel space. Uh, there's a couple of different linkers that are being worked on, although they're still a work in progress. One of them is similar to the GNU linker, LDD, uh, sorry, rather, LLD, rather. The other one, MC linker, is designed more for linking on an embedded target, so it's not as... Uh, optimized, but it's fast and uses less memory, okay? Uh, then there's a number of other tools like Static Analyzer, which we'll talk a little bit about later, and uh, there's a debugger that, again, is uh, essentially a drop-in replacement for uh, GDB. A lot of other tools, too. Uh, we're not going to necessarily talk about those today, but that's, in essence, what LLVM is. A set of libraries to build tools and a series of tools that build up uh, a tool chain, a traditional tool chain. Okay, so the next thing I always get asked, and it doesn't matter whether I'm at an airport or in the, the hallway, people are always ask, well, why would you bother, right? Why not just keep using the same tool chain we've always been using? It's been good enough for the last 30 years. Why not continue down that road? There's nothing wrong with GCC. I love GCC. I've used it most of my professional career. It's great. However, there are a number of things that alternate tool chains bring to the table. There we go. Uh, the first one that uh, came to mind w when I'm asked this question is, and it looks like we split two slides, fast compiles. Okay, so one of the things about having a greenfield compiler is they were able to optimize everything down to make things as fast as they possibly can. And in fact, in a lot of the, the um, uh, uh, tests that you can do for timing, uh, ultimately you find that in fact in certain situations, uh, Clang actually outperforms GCC by a, a huge margin. And in a lot of situations, that's because they're sticking strictly to the standards and they're not going some of the extra miles that, that GCC is doing. And there's a few features later that we'll talk about that Clang doesn't do, because amongst other things, it would slow things way down because it complicates the architecture. Now, I will fully admit that I have pick and chose, chose the, uh, the uh, slides here that make Clang look the best, okay? I'm, I'm not trying to say that GCC isn't a good compiler. It's just that there are situations where Clang outperforms GCC. In a lot of other situations, they're very close. Okay, so again, I'm not trying to put anybody down. In this case, Clang tends to be faster. It tends to use less memory. Okay, the next thing is it's a really fast-moving project. I know a lot of projects in open source are fast-moving, okay? Uh, certainly the kernel. We, we see over and over again how fast it moves, and anybody who hangs out on LKML can see how fast things move. Uh, it's rather dizzying for me. Uh, one of the things about LLVM that's really exciting is it's, it's actually a pretty young compiler. It's only been around for about, uh, well, sorry, LLVM has only been around for about 10 years. Clang has only been around for just over half of that. And in fact, in a very few years, it's actually caught up 
to what Clang, uh, sorry, what GCC can do in a, a large uh, degree, right? It's faster. It's uh, in many ways it's it's as standards compliant or more standards compliant, and uh, performance-wise, it's actually getting pretty close to what's possible. Again, I've chosen a slide that happens to show Clang outperforming GCC in this case, both 4.7 and 4.8. Okay, not always the case. You'll find that when it comes to vectorization, GCC still wins. Okay. But again, that's changing very rapidly. You can see just from 3.2 to the 3.3 time frame for Clang, there's actually a, a marked improvement that took us from the kind of performance that we're seeing in GCC to something that's considerably faster. Okay, so this is another reason why you'd want to use it. Is it way, way, way better? No, but it is getting better at a very high rate. Okay, so we've caught up at this point. It very well could actually surpass it in a re relatively short period of time. I'm not saying it will, I'm saying it could, all right? The next thing is there's a lot of projects, a lot of companies, a lot of people working on different things all at the same time. Uh, as soon as you start working with multiple processors, multiple boards, multiple products, all of a sudden you have to start dealing with a whole bunch of different kinds of tools. Now, one of my favorite times when I started working on projects where I could use GCC across the entire problem space. That made my life a whole lot easier, okay? One of the neat things about LLVM is it actually pushes into a few places that GCC doesn't touch, things like the GPU, things like uh, vision on small micros and that sort of thing. And so you'll, you see it used in places like kernel space and user space libraries. Uh, you see it used in applications, certainly in mobile embedded. It's very, it's becoming very popular, certain on, certainly on the other non-Android platform. Um, but you'll see it for de developing, uh, uh, extracting documentation. There's some, some code that does that, much like uh, Doxygen does, or Javadoc, or what have you, or kernel doc. Uh, and it's also very heavily used in HPC. And the reason that is is because you can actually take uh, the, the interchange format, uh, what's called RTL in, in uh, GCC, but it's LLIR, the interchange uh, format that's being used in, in, um, uh, in LLVM, and they're using that to actually optimize what's happening in highly parallel cluster state systems, all right? So you see it used in a lot of very targeted areas, things like audio, things like uh, video replacing parts of GPU you'll see in a lot of embedded systems now and systems with low-end video cards. They're using LLVM pipe. And so what they're doing is they're implementing shaders and that sort of thing that are traditionally done in hardware, in software, and they can do that through using um, the LLVM uh, technology. You also see that CUDA, right, whether it's on uh, AMD chip, um, well, I guess ATI chipsets originally, or NVIDIA, all the CUDA stuff there is ultimately based on LLVM. And in fact, render script on your Android phones, you know those little an animated backgrounds, you know, Smoke or Koi Pond or whatever else, that's actually running on the GPU, okay? And the reason, the reason that can run on the GPU is because you're taking the render script, which is a C-like language, and compiling it down to whatever the GPU is on your actual phone at the time. That's actually done on the phone using LLVM, right? So it gets shipped as a, as a interchange format and then it's compiled out to GPU code on the fly, on, on the phone itself. What that means is your CPU can go to sleep and your battery gets saved, right? The GPU's gotta be on anyways, it's driving the screen. GPU can go to sleep. Those are the kinds of things you can do with that. And one of the reasons that having a single tool chain for this is useful is you start getting to the point where any optimizations, any extensions, any things that you fix, all of a sudden it applies to your entire problem space, not just a part of it, because the problem space has now got bigger. All right, so that's another advantage uh, for using LLVM. The next one is license. Sadly, this matters to some people. Okay, I'm a GPL guy and everything else, but what it comes down to is certain situations don't allow you to link GPL code into whatever else it happens to be, whether that's BSD or proprietary, kind of situation. The nice thing about LLVM is it is a very permissive license. It allows you to build it into your, your free project. It also allows you to build it into a proprietary project. What that means is, again, you can take that same parser, that same grammar, that same set of utilities and libraries that are built around these technologies and build it into whatever you happen to, uh, to be building. Now, the side effect of the BSD, of course, is that people don't always play nice, they don't always share their code back again. What you see in the LLVM community 
is that a lot of stuff is sent back again. Now, there are certain things that aren't, but in general, the code is moving very, very fast, and people get that it makes sense to push code upstream. And if you certainly hang out on, on the IRC channel for LLVM, you'll see people from a lot of different companies pushing stuff up, asking questions. Uh, people get that pushing code upstream into LLVM makes sense. Like I said, fast moving project. Very helpful project too. Always people there uh, trying to help. Other thing that's really cool about this is you have a lot of full time coders extending and, and fixing and making the compiler better. Some of them are open source coders. Some of them are not, okay? On the surface, that doesn't necessarily sound like a good thing, but that means that there are companies, really big publicly traded companies, that are paying people to make your compiler better, okay? That's not a bad thing, right? The Googles, the Apples, the other people in the world that actually pay LLVM coders are actually contributing to making this, this compiler better, faster, smarter, less memory, whatever. That's a good thing. And some of those people can find NDAs, which means they can sometimes push certain optimizations into hardware even better, whereas open source coders can't always do that. So there are advantages to having that kind of thing. It's a very wide development uh, audience that uh, develops it. The other one that's kind of cool is something called Static Analyzer, the Client Static Analyzer. And uh, we just recently got this working. We had a, a Google Summer of Code student, and he'll actually be here later on. If anyone's sticking around for the next conference, he'll, he'll be uh, uh, at the, uh, the LLVM microconference that we're having uh, on uh, Thursday. He actually got the Static Analyzer working with the kernel, which is really great. Static Analyzer is a little bit like all the other tools we have, like Coxnell and Smatch and, and, and so on. Uh, however, again, it's built on top of the compiler technology itself. So instead of having to re-implement the parser, the, the, the grammar of C++, re-implement all the parts so they can understand the code, it's actually using the compiler to take it through to the AST parse tree, and then it's, a, it's actually looking at that in order to figure out what's going on at the uh, static analysis level. So this is a really, really simple example, but this is showing basically that if opdark is null, essentially we drop through and we get down to a point where we actually end up using it. We actually pass null to string to ul. Okay, now this is really simple. If you actually follow through some of the more uh, difficult or complex examples, you'll actually find that it'll actually jump through multiple functions all over the place and come back again and 50 steps lead you from a set of inputs to a potential failure, some sort of segmentation fault or, or panic or what have you. Okay, so there's a lot of really interesting, neat things that can be done here. Now, most of the checkers that are built into Static Analyzer right now are targeted at user space. All right, so user space applications and that sort of thing. Uh, one of the cool things is that we have actually turned off a lot of the ones that don't, we don't really care about, like malloc and free, for instance. Um, and we've turned around and we've started to add some kernel-specific ones. Okay? And the really cool thing is, is that every once in a while uh, in, in the uh, kernel community, people find a common problem uh, or, or something that people are doing over and over again, and ultimately people extend check patch or they add it to the coding standards or whatever else. Potentially, Static Analyzer could actually be extended in order to look for these problems, a very deep problem, that cross functions and ultimately, um, you know, have deep, deep problems that people can't necessarily find just by, by uh, reviewing the code. So it's actually pretty interesting. We actually have a, um, we have, actually have this running once a day on our build box that we talk about later. There's a link on our website that actually will show you what it currently looks like, what the output of that currently looks like. The other one we, that, that uh, Clang actually introduced that's very handy is something called Fixit Hints. Now, Fixit Hints are something that I wish I had a long time ago. Okay, and the cool thing is, is that recently, Fixit Hints to the same level that you can get in Clang have been added to GCC. If you use GCC uh, 4.8, 4.7 wasn't bad. 4.8 actually has Fixit Hints that are almost as good and in some cases are a little bit better than Clang. Okay, so they're, they're, again, it, they've caught up to each other. This is one of those situations where having real competition between compilers has actually pushed the incumbent to actually come up to the same level. Okay, because Clang really blew GCC away for, for at least the last year and a half in this regard. Okay, and the cool thing, again, this is a relatively simple example, and apparently the contrast is really terrible on this particular um, projector, but it's showing you that there's a particular use of old GNU-style field designators. So instead of saying dot x equals, it's saying x colon 
was the old way of, of uh, doing structure assignment. All right, and so essentially what happens is it finds a problem, it tells you what the problem is, and then it will actually um, propose a fix. And in fact, one of our project members actually used this code in with a little bit of Python magic to actually spit out new code, uh, which was kind of interesting. Okay, one of the things that we, I don't have on the slide anymore, but it'll actually do macro expansion too. Again, something that GCC now does. So the neat thing is instead of saying, there is an error on this line, which happens to be full of macros, you go figure it out. It'll say, it's on this line here, which is in this macro, which is here, which is in this macro, which is here, and here's your actual problem, drilling all the way through all the macros. And again, GCC 4.8 now does that. It didn't used to. Now it does. There's that competition that's really making things better. Another good reason for having two. The next one is actually a quote from Michael K. Johnson, who happens to be sitting in the, near the front of the room here. I didn't uh, realize he was gonna be here, but essentially on G Plus the other day, it was actually Ted Sows, uh, <laughs> who's sitting next to him, uh, had a post the other day talking about, uh, about the random number generator. Uh, and uh, in the middle was this, this comment, which I really wanted to bring up, and it's essentially, uh, Michael was pointing out that having more than one compiler that have fundamentally different internals, different ar ar architectures internal, make it much more difficult for somebody to attack a, a system that is running a kernel uh, with a compiler that you don't necessarily know what it is. It's very hard to do like a remote timing attack or what have you uh, on that. Exactly, reflections on trusting trust. And of course, there's a lot of other kinds of things too. A lot of the, the, the Kerningham and Ritchie, sorry, the um, Kerningham uh, backdoor uh, attack that he did way back when, where he, he, uh, he trojaned uh, the login command and the compiler in order to always have a, a backdoor into Unix systems. That's something that, that's not as easy, easily done and certainly uh, approaching a possible when you start having more than one compiler and you can start comparing the outputs of those two compilers, two independent compilers. Okay, so you, there is an aspect of security that you gain by having a, uh, a choice. There's also lots of other really cool things. I encourage you to go and watch. There's a talk that was given uh, at one of the LVM conferences by a fellow at Google. He built this really crazy tool that actually takes a look at the C++ code that Google has, and apparently they've got a crazy amount of C++ code that runs all the stuff that we like using on their websites. And he took uh, a tool built on LLVM, and he actually compiled it through to the AST parse tree, and then looked for common bugs, common API changes, and so on and so forth, a little bit like what Static Analyzer does, but he compiled it through back into C++ code. Okay, so it's going from C++ code, through a series of filters, back out to C++ code. And if they're different, essentially the original comp the, uh, developer was sent an email saying, here's the fix, does this make sense? So imagine LKML, but the robots are po posting the patches. It's ser seriously awesome, you gotta see the, the movie. It's, it's well worth watching. My whole point is potentially something like that could be done for the kernel, okay? Now this isn't directly related to using Clang to build the kernel, but it's a, a tangential uh, um, technology that can be used by making the code actually work with this particular parser and grammar, we get that potential side benefit as well. Okay, already used by a lot of different projects. Uh, as I said previously, it's part of RenderStript. Um, it actually supports ARM, MIPS, x86. Anyone who puts a handset out, an Android handset out, uh, ultimately has to make sure that RenderStrip works on their particular GPU, right, so it's a handset problem. Uh, you just have to write a RenderScript program. It will run on all the different platforms as long as they support RenderScript. Again, it's uh, used in a lot of video stuff for shaders and LVM pipe and so on and so forth. And this is being used already in places like Ubuntu on lower end machines that don't have good GPUs. Uh, it's also something that is being pushed into, into projects like Yocto. It's something that um, Lenar was looking at on ARM and so on and so forth. It's actually making it a lot into the embedded world, where again, our GPUs aren't necessarily as fast as they might, as we might want them to be. And uh, again, actually during the LVM microconference that we have later this week, uh, we actually have Sylvester LeDrew coming to talk about his work on compiling Debian with Clang. And what he's been doing for several years is recompiling the whole Debian package archive with Clang and then publishing essentially how far he got. And last I checked, he was over 80%. It's sort of 
fluctuates, and the reason is, is because every, um, uh, the code that he's compiling gets better. The compiler gets better. Okay, the problem is, unfortunately, is, is they sort of get into parts where Clang finds more problems, even though people have removed other problems, and so you, you get this bounce effect where uh, something that did work doesn't work anymore, and something that didn't work now works. And, and so essentially, we're, we're somewhere between 80 and 90 percent, and it, it keeps on moving around. But ultimately, again, what he's finding is, is that there's a lot of code that is becoming more standards compliant, and as it becomes more standards compliant and not, well, it doesn't use GCC extensions so much, ultimately Clang mostly just works, okay? Which is a similar problem we have in the Linux kernel. Now, before we get to the actual Linux kernel part itself, I'll just talk a little bit about my project, uh, the project I'm a part of, and there's a few project members in the, the room right now. Essentially, we are working to essentially port Linux to work with Clang. And uh, the idea that we, we really want to do is we want to bring together like-minded people. There were a lot of different people that were doing this, put them all under a single umbrella, get them to work together, um, ultimately to get the thing to work at all which it, it mostly does right now. Uh, also discover problems that are happening as LLVM and the kernel progress. Uh, new problems get introduced. Now, we're not there yet on the kernel side, but on the LLVM side, we're already starting to find uh, there are new features, new bug fixes that are going into LLVM that then break other things. So, for instance, we have a target for Nexus 7. It was working great, and then all of a sudden it broke. And the reason was is because a fix went in for another problem that actually broke the Nexus 7 build, and the guy that we have that works on that essentially worked with the LLVM guys and ultimately managed to fix the problem, and it ended up being a problem that would have bit other people in the future, but we were able to find it very rapidly. So we found the bug within, uh, I think it was two days of the bug being introduced to their, their uh, SVN, and yeah, they use SVN, you know, instead of Git, but whatever. Um, but uh, ultimately, it was, it was fixed within two weeks, which was kind of, kind of nice. And that was mostly because they couldn't get a hold of the developer in the first place. Okay, so, it, you know, these things are getting fixed a lot faster than they used to. And ultimately, the project, of course, is to upstream, upstream fixes to both the LVM project and to the kernel community. So we do this through a number of different tools. We've got a, an automated uh, build system. Originally, we had to patch both LLVM and Clang independently, as well as actually QMU and a few other things to get these things to work properly. Um, basically, having a great big document telling how to do this really raised the barrier to entry. So a uh, series of scripts, make scripts basically are put together to download, patch the code, build it, uh, so you can actually get it all work together. So it downloads the code for LLVM, Clang, it downloads any cross-tool chains that are necessary. We'll talk about why that is in a second. The kernel code, QMU, and different test images. And ultimately makes them all work together so that we can see whether or not there is a bug or not. Okay? The whole build infrastructure is just scripts and patches. That's it. Okay? We're not trying to, to fork anything. We're not trying to, you know, get you to use our version of Clang or our version of the kernel. No, we're, we're trying to build on top of what's already out there. I like to call our project a meta project, okay? We're not trying to, we're trying to add to everybody else's project, not our own, okay? We want to make this work everybody else. Recently, we added the ability uh, to actually not only build from our version of Clang, our, our patch version of Clang, rather, but to also use different sources. So we can use the one that's built from source out of our scripts. We can use a pre-built LLVM. We're actually at a point now where LLVM uh, 3.3 now works out of the box with the Linux kernel. So we can actually use the pre-built one from LLVM.org. There's packages there for whatever distribution you want to use, or natively installed ones. So depending on what distro you're using, you can just yum install, apt get install, whatever, uh, the 3.3 version of, of uh, Clang. Now, again, we'll talk in a second about why we need this, but unfortunately we still need the GNU assembler and the GNU linker to build the kernel, okay? So, in the cross situation, we actually have to download one of those as well and make sure it's installed. And again, you have a, a choice for, these are ARM related, but Code Sorcery, Linaro, Android, or the native built one, okay? Again, if it's not there, it'll download it, it'll install it for you, so you don't have to worry about that. And you can choose which one you want to use at the command line. So the targets that we, we uh, build and 
uh, try to test on as much as we can. x86-64, obviously, that's the big one we have to, have to support. Versatile Express is the one I do most of my work on, and that's, that's the ARM side. Uh, we use QMU for testing that. Okay, we're actually trying to do the same thing with x86-64. Uh, we're not having as much luck there, unfortunately. I don't think QMU is, is not uh, giving us the same kind of test coverage we're getting on the ARM side. That's a work in progress. That's not... It, it just, we just, we've been doing ARM, the ARM tests for well over a year and a half. The x86 stuff is only a couple months old. It's just work in progress, that's all it is. We're, we're finding certain situations we will boot under QMU and it works, then we try it on real hardware and it doesn't, essentially. So, um, we've also got uh, a port to Raspberry Pi and uh, the Nexus 7, and that's, those are actually the two that have broken uh, with LLVM upstream recently that we've actually had fixes for. We've also got some work uh, getting the Galaxy S3 to work, although that's had a couple of issues. Um, and uh, my pet projects are actually getting the BeagleBone and ARM64 to work. Not that I have real ARM64 uh, hardware, but just to try and get that, uh, get that compiling on most of the way there. We try to automate as much as we can. We're not a, a huge project, um, so we have a build bot that does this, this code on a regular basis. Uh, downloads the code, patches it, and so on. Uh, we try to run an LTP test suite every night in order to try and catch problems so we can see what's going on. Uh, we, again, just trying to run these things on a regular basis. We recently started running the static analyzer lightly, too, so uh, there should always be a uh, latest version of the static analyzer output that's available. Okay. Now on to the real interesting stuff, which is the actual status of compiling the kernel. Okay. The first one I've already talked about a little bit, and that is that LVM as of 3.3 doesn't need any patches. Okay, before that there were a few things we needed patched, otherwise it would, it would crash uh, with the kernel code, or uh, spit out the wrong code for the kernel in certain situations. The thing about the kernel code is it pushes compilers further and harder, I think, than any other code base. All right, so, I mean, th this is the thing that was really interesting. A bunch of the times when, when problems were found with uh, Clang, we would say, well, it doesn't work with this code. And they're like, well, we use it for all this other stuff. We've never seen this problem before. The Linux kernel pushes the compiler that hard. Okay, so we've found problems that nobody else has found, even though it's used for other kernels. All right. So, Upstream now works 3.3. There's still a couple of things that we can't do. We can't use the integrated assembler, which is a bit of a pain. We'll talk about that later. Uh, we can't compile boot code for x86 because we don't support 16-bit uh, code, unfortunately. Yeah. I know. We've, we've asked about that, and unfortunately what it comes down to is the amount of work that it'll require to support code 16 uh, is sufficiently large that uh, nobody has the time to do it. it. Essentially, there's only a very few narrow places where it makes sense. I, I agree with you. Unfortunately, um, it's not something that's likely to ever happen, so, which really sucks. Um, oh yeah, and then of course, as I said before, we're getting a lot of support from the LLVM compiler developers. Whenever new problems come along, uh, they are highly motivated to fix issues that we are now finding in the Linux kernel. Uh, sorry, that we were finding when compiling the Linux kernel, I should say. And wherever possible, we're trying to get things changed in LLVM as opposed to just changing the kernel. But there's, I'm gonna show you some examples where we don't have that option. Okay, so now we're on to the, channel, the challenges of actually building the kernel itself. So the first thing is, unfortunately, different compilers have different standards that they, uh, that they support. Now, GCC supports all the different standards to varying levels, but it defaults to GNU 90. Now, it used to actually default to GNU 89, which is a real standard. Well, it, <laughs> it, it's C89 with a bunch of extra magic, okay? But I recently realized when I was preparing these slides that the standard recently changed, and it's now called GNU 90. And GNU 90 is apparently GNU 89, but with a bunch of the C99 stuff ported back again. Okay, so it's this weird mishmash of several different standards that is becoming more standards compliant, but it's still very GCC-ish, okay? But the problem we have, unfortunately, is that we now have Clang, we are now compiling the kernel with Clang, uh, with uh, GNU 99, 
because Clang supports GNU 99 out of the box, which is essentially C99 with a couple of GNUisms, okay, versus GNU 90. So we're, we're having a few impedance mismatches between the code because GNU 90 sees the code in this fashion and GNU 99 sees it in this fashion, okay? Now, the good thing is, is that GCC is slowly moving towards C99 uh, standards by default, which is awesome because that makes it even easier for Clang to work, right, to interoperate. And in fact, I know of a couple of people that are doing this already because as we move to the next version of GCC, it's becoming even more C99 compliant, and so they want to make sure that the Linux kernel code, again, follows C99 standards as much as they possibly can. That can only help both compilers. The kernel also s expects a certain f functionality that is, oh, that, is, uh, that is added specifically to GCC for the kernel and wasn't necessarily written down. So there's a few things there that don't necessarily track, and to a large degree, the, the GCC-isms that make sense, the LLVM guys have added, where it doesn't make sense, in other words, it doesn't fit into their architecture, they've pushed back, okay? But the problem is if it's not written down anywhere, there's no doc, there's no specification to write to, and so they haven't been able to add those kinds of, of uh, functionality. So they basically say, if there's stuff that's not in the documentation, we won't support it. We'll only support docu documented features. There's also a number of GCC extensions and flags that aren't supported. And uh, one of our frustrations also we found is that a number of the built-in functions are different. They're, they're ever so slightly different and sometimes hard to find the, the, what the differences are. But that's to be expected because built-ins, of course, are not portable. So the first problem we had when we started looking at this is that kbuild is very GCC-centric, okay? So it makes the assumption that you're using a, a GCC or GCC-like, uh, rather, using a GCC-like compiler. Amongst other things, GCC will complain. If you give it a flag that it doesn't understand, it will say, nope, I don't understand this, and fail, okay? Clang, on the other hand, will say, I don't support this, but I'm gonna continue. Okay, so the problem is, is you actually get to a point where CC option, which is a macro that tries to figure out whether an option is supported by a kernel, uh, by a compiler, I should say, uh, essentially breaks. Because as far as Clang con uh, is concerned, based on the macro, it supports everything. Okay, so unfortunately we had to put an if def into the make file that essentially looked at the warning output with grep to figure out whether or not that something was supported or not. I know, it doesn't make sense. They were trying to be permissive, apparently. So they're trying not to break a, a compiler. The point is, is that flags generally are a good idea and not necessarily required. There are certain situations where that's not true. But I, I would agree with you on that. So uh, there are a number of people in the Clang community that agree with you and, and me on that. Um, there have been a number of uh, efforts to change that and unfortunately, they've broken a number of large systems outside of this, and so a lot of people actually already depend on this functionality, and so the change hasn't been able to be made the, the default yet. So people are still working on it, and I, I hope it to be fixed one day. But right now, we, we don't have a choice, so unfortunately, we have to do this. It, but it's, it's only three macros we have to rewrite, and essentially, it's a pipe with a grep, and that's all it is. It's nothing too horrible. It's hidden. Yes. The, they are run way too many times, yeah. Yeah. You, you'll find that the, the Clang build of the kernel is still faster than GCC despite the extra forks. So. Um, right, so we had to add patches specifically for K build. The next one is name registers, and this has been a bit of a problem. GCC has this quite nice extension that allows you to name a register as a C variable, and so as a result, you can use it directly. You can use the stack pointer directly, for instance, which is where we use it the most in the kernel. So for instance, in x86, we, uh, the, the, uh, the code actually assigns ESP to current stack pointer in ARM. It's SP that's assigned to the uh, same variable. Unfortunately, name variables are not something that Clang can support, and the reason is is because the code is up here, the machine code generator is down here, and the AST is in the middle, and that information isn't available above the AST. 
Okay? This is something I've asked for several times and talked to the, talked to the various guys on the, uh, the list. Unfortunately, this is not something they can support even for the stack pointer. Now, I'm still having this argument, but essentially what this comes down to is we have to, uh, to, to, to compile with Clang. Unfortunately, we have to drop back to inline assembly, which really sucks. Um, those of you who saw my patches this week, we, we sent in a bunch of patches that, that tried to get rid of this on the ARM side. Unfortunately, it incurs an extra assignment, which means that the code is very, very similar, except, yes, there is a push at the beginning and a pop at the end, which kind of sucks, and, a, and an assignment. So we're not entirely there yet. We're trying to figure out a way around that, because obviously uh, this potentially can happen a lot, and all those extra instructions kind of suck. So, but again, we've got a couple of ideas of how to get around it. We might have to resort to an if def for now until it gets, maybe we can figure something else out. But I, we are making noise about this and trying to figure out if we can get this fixed. But not, not in 3.3. It's already, it's already done. The next one is something we refer to as VLACE, or variable length arrays in structs. Now, VLAs, or variable length arrays, is something that's supported by the, by the standard. Okay, a variable length array is an array that you don't know the length of it until runtime. Okay, which is actually pretty cool. You can do some neat things with that. Not everybody in the kernel community likes VLAs, but they do make certain things easier. Okay, the problem is, is when you put them into structs. So you'll see right here what we're actually doing is we've got a variable length array in a struct with something after it. Now you can actually put a undefined array at the end of a structure, okay? That, that is allowed by the, by the standard. However, C99 and C11 explicitly forbid you to put, to do this, to essentially have a variable length array in a struct that's not at the very end, okay? So the problem is, is we actually do this in a number of places. Uh, it's actually used uh, in the net filter code. It's used pervasively in the crypto code, and it's used in a couple other places like the gadget driver for USB. Now, in the USB cases, it's just used for convenience, and they're, they're okay with a patch there. Um, the problem is, is in the other areas. It's, it's very pervasive. It, uh, it breaks a lot of stuff. Unfortunately, we have to patch that out, and that's something that, that we're having some, some pushback on, unfortunately. This is not something that can be added to Clang. Again, we've asked. The problem is it would take major structural changes uh, inside Clang that are detrimental to a number of other things that Clang can do. So it's, it's, not, a, it's not a feature that can be supported. And since it's expli expressively forbidden by the standards, it's not something that people want to touch. The next one is nested functions. Okay, this is only used in, a, in one place that I'm aware of, but apparently it's, it, people have found it in other places. Uh, this one's actually in the ThinkPad ACPI driver. I've posted a patch a couple of times. I've never heard back from the, the maintainer, unfortunately. Um, it doesn't really do anything useful in that code. It's a fairly simple patch. It just shovels the code around a little bit. Uh, unfortunately, again, not supported by the standard. It's not standard C. Clang doesn't support it. Uh, fortunately, it only affects ThinkPad users so it's, uh, that, that use this, this older driver. So. Not a lot of people are too worried about it. There are some other incompatibilities that go a little bit further, they're a little bit harder though. Um, one of them is that attributes, which again is a, uh, an extension. A lot of the attributes are the same between the two compilers. However, there's some slight differences that can cause problems. When it comes to modules, for instance, we alias the init and exit code. All right, that, that, that's how it works when we're doing um, out of tree modules. The problem, unfortunately, is that other attributes that are associated with those symbols are not aliased over at the same time. So things like the link section. Okay, so unfortunately, in this case, what we had to do to get it to work with Clang is we had to uh, reapply init and exit sections, linker sections to those, those symbols. Okay, not a huge deal, but again, it's something that GCC is doing quite handily, Clang can't, and so it's a matter of reapplying those, those uh, linker sections. Now, it actually still compiles, it's just a matter of, and you can actually load a module, you just can't unload a module, and that's kind of important. It's not something that we, um, it's not something we realized until recently, so we haven't actually looked into fixing it yet. I would hope so, but right now it's, it's such a small patch, and it doesn't hurt anything, 
that, that we would like to push it upstream and then unpatch it when we don't need it anymore, if, if that's acceptable. We haven't, we actually haven't had that conversation yet, so I mean, that's, that's part of it. We've had a, To be, to be really fair, they've been very permissive. They've taken a lot of patches. They've made a lot of changes. Uh, we aren't having as much luck on the kernel side. So quite honestly, we're getting way more pushback from kernel developers than we do from LLVM. And what it comes down to, what it comes down to is on the kernel side, we're getting pushback. Th th that is reasonable. I'm, I'm not trying to, to complain here, but we're getting pushback on small things. On LLVM, we're only getting pushback on really major structural things. On the small stuff, they're saying no problems, we'll help you. So I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to point any fingers here, I'm purely saying that there's, there's a perception that, that you, you just brought up. The perception is, I, I don't think is, is necessarily fair. For, for, the, for the small things, uh, for the, the, the reasonable things, they are, they are bending over backwards. Okay, I'm sorry, I apologize. evolving for the moment yes 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 of course of course agreed agreed um, if you actually look okay so so ju just to to um, uh, to to repeat that so everybody can hear the um, the question is essentially that the, the kernel is written in a, a dialect of C that is essentially C with a few GCCisms for, for historical reasons. Uh, the concern is that adding Clang specific stuff can potentially um, make maintenance more difficult. Is that, is that fair? Okay. Uh, I agree. If you, actually, if you actually look at the patches that we're proposing, most of them are very small, innocuous, and don't have major I, I at least feel that they don't have a major impact on the overall maintenance. They're very, very small. Now, in certain situations, uh, like named uh, registers, you're right, there are extra instructions involved, and I would, I would argue that that's not necessarily a good thing. Um, but we are trying to address those, those issues. We're not trying to make the kernel code worse. It, we're trying to make it work in both cases as, as well as we possibly can. So we're certainly gonna work as well as we can to address all these concerns. But like I said, as much, if not more, um, help and, and, and bending over backwards is being done on the LLVM side. So pl please don't feel that they're, they're saying no, they really want to get this to work. No, no, I, I just, I'm just making, making sure we're all clear on that. So that's all. Is that cool? Oh, they suck. Oh, no, no, we, we don't want to use the FDFs, and we, we've, we've barely used them at all. We're trying very hard not to use them. I, we completely agree, completely agree on that. If FDFs are evil. The next one is actually to do, again, with the GNU 89, GNU 99 changes. And they have to do with, uh, essentially, GNU 89 and 99 actually disagree on how, how uh, inline functions are done. Um, Essentially, GNU 89 allows you to have two definitions, one that's inline, one that's not, okay? But it doesn't, the inline actually doesn't emit a function, an externable function, okay? In C99, in fact, there is an externable function that's, that's uh, uh, defined at that point. So you actually have an inline version and a non-inline version with the same statement. The 
appropriate answer here is to essentially change it into using static inline. And whenever we've had this conversation with people, ultimately the maintainers involved have said, yeah, absolutely, make it a static inline. And so we've got a few places that we've done that already in the x86 side. Actually, Greg, Greg uh, Crow Hartman helped us with those. Uh, we have a number of more that have to be done on the ARM side that we still need to make changes for. It is the right thing. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Right. Right. Th this is essentially doing the same thing. Uh, sorry, in, in, in these particular examples that we're talking about, static inline does the right thing in both cases for both compilers. So I mean, perhaps we can talk a little bit more about that afterwards. Okay, the next thing is there's a couple of places where we have uh, very complex statements that ultimately a clang chokes on. So in this case, we can see there is an alignment statement there that's relatively complicated. We merely broke it into two statements. It actually, I, I think it actually makes it a little bit easier to read. Essentially, it does exactly the same thing. Both, T, uh, both GCC and Clang actually end up doing the same thing with that particular code. Okay, the big thing is, of course, unfortunately, that uh, the integrated assembler actually can't be used. And again, that has to do with code 16, and um, in the case of ARM, the, the problem is the inline assembly isn't actually in unified format. It's in the pre-unified format using a lot of new extensions. Unfortunately, the, the, uh, the I, IA guys have tried to add the extensions. Unfortunately, uh, there's agreement between both the GCC and the, the Clang camps that it's a bad idea to introduce those GCC isms in there. The pervading uh, thought is that we should really bring all of the assembly code up to using unified uh, assembly uh, format language, okay, which is the same language, as, uh, same uh, format rather that's used across tools. Unfortunately, this isn't something that's easily fixed. Again, unfortunately, it means making changes to all the inline assembly in the kernel for, for ARM to bring it up to a standard so that IA can be used. For the moment, we just turn IA off and we just revert to using the GNU assembler. But it means we slow down, there's more forks during the build, and it means there isn't as much um, error uh, fix-it hints that can be added. Okay, right now we're down to this number of patches. Uh, we have uh, patches to the general kernel, mostly K build. We have 18 of them, and again, they're just, you know, tiny little patches. Uh, we have R 11 that are specific to ARM, six that are currently specific to ARM 64, and we're down to eight for x86-64. Okay, so what's left to do? We're mostly upstreaming patches right now. Uh, there's still a bunch of stuff that needs to be tested and fixed. We don't claim that everything is working although we've got a list of kernel uh, options that are currently broken on our website. Uh, we still have a number of section mismatches and uh, merge global issues that are, that are being reported. Uh, we haven't figured out whether they're necessarily causing problems yet. We have only in the case of the init and exit code. Okay, but ultimately uh, we need to track those down a little bit more. Okay, and uh, finally, of course, enabling IA would be really awesome. It would give uh, uh, considerably better uh, code coverage and, and allow Clang to work that much better. How can you help? Well, I've already said a lot of those kinds of things. Come join the project, report bugs, try our patches, help us get our patches upstream, uh, submit new patches, all that good stuff. And I know I rushed the last couple of slides, but uh, we're essentially out of time. Any questions that you guys want to have, uh, I can stick around afterwards to talk, because we're into lunch now, but otherwise, um, Let's, let's do some quick questions here. Yes? Runtime performance. Okay, people always want to know, is it faster? And in certain situations, the, the Phronix tests have shown that uh, general code is um, similarly fast, in some cases faster, in some cases slower. We haven't done the same sort of thing on the Linux kernel because profiling the kernel in general is difficult. Uh, I'm not saying that it can't be done, it's just that we haven't spent the time on it. I imagine that, that it is similar. Um, I would probably err on the side of being a little bit slower because there's certain optimizations we can't do yet. 
okay? But it's, it's close. I wouldn't, I wouldn't pretend to say we're outperforming GCC yet. Yeah, Mark. As well. So, so being able to compile the code base and analyze the, co the code base yep. may prove valuable in and of itself independent of running That's the code. True. We actually have several people on the mailing list that are actually doing exactly that. They are taking the Linux kernel code, they're uh, compiling it to LLIR or to the AST parse tree and then, and then actually evaluating how efficient it is. Uh, it seems like that's a very popular uh, academic pr thing that people are doing right now, which is, which is kind of cool. Yeah. yeah. If you are interested in, uh, you know, making the performance argument. Yes. Um, something we keep asking the GCC folks for and never actually get. Okay. Is we, the, the Linux, the, the kernel is by all, more or less, more or less a one large event handler. It is, absolutely. It runs, a lot of it runs cache cold much more often than you would see user space code. True. And for that reason, code size matters a lot more in the kernel than it does, it does. in the rest. Agreed. The problem is if you compile minus OS, right. GCC assumes that you are basically trying to squeeze into a ROM and that okay. you're trying desperately to do anything you c possibly can to squeeze that code into that ROM because you can't ship your product otherwise. Right. And so we end up produce, it, it produces code that is faster 80% of the time, right. but the remaining 20% more than make up for it. Right. So we would really like to see something that is hev a, 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 an optimization mode that is heavily biased for size, right. Right. but isn't completely stupid about it. Right. Well, I, I can't talk directly to that, however, I've played a little bit with OS and the various O levels um, when comparing actually the Blaze code, uh, both in GCC and in Clang. And one of the things that I found interesting is that O3 and OS actually are very similar in Clang. And they both tend to be smaller uh, code size wise than uh, the GCC stuff. So very narrow example, but I, I found it interesting that OS and O3 seem to be the same in a lot of situations. So maybe, Maybe that, 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 that might be the case. I don't know. I, I can't say one way or the other, but I found that kind of interesting. They were the same size. Any other questions? Yeah. Working on the t-shirt. Working on a t-shirt? <laughs> well, I've, I've got stickers with me. Uh, t-shirts, uh, this, this, I mean, certainly if you want one, they, um, I got this printed at uh, one of those online things. I, I can certainly put up a store if any of you want one. <laughs> Yeah, this is our logo. So it's the uh, obviously tucks with the uh, the um, Clang compiler wings on it. So thank you. <laughs> Anybody else? Any other questions? Okay. If anybody wants a Clang sticker, I've got some up here.